and I don't get to spend time with the people on Twitter and learn about their businesses and whatever they're facing. And that's kind of where I draw all my creativity and my energy from other people in that regard. So it's a, it's not a win-win, I guess. It's a, it's a little bit of a loss, but yes, technically I am. So, and I, I guess you too, right? It must be, what is it now? Like six-ish? Yes, just about six. Yeah, it's minutes. just about to be six. Okay. Well, that's good. I'm, I'm glad that you found such a good time for me as well. And uh, hopefully also for you and everybody who joins today just for the timing. It's always it's super hard to coordinate and it's going to be even harder. I'm currently planning a move to Canada, which oh, is oh. six hours behind even more. Yeah. So that would now be at like what, 8.30 in the morning for me and uh, 6 p.m. for you. It's going to be hard to coordinate these things, but I, I hope I'll still figure it out in a way. We can. Um, so the, the thing about uh, us young folks is that for us, pretty much between 6 p.m. to 9, 9.30 p.m., people are about, people can join in. The mm -hmm. restaurants remain open easily till 9, 30, 10 p.m. Yeah. Um, people push their dinners or have an early dinner. So even we, we have uh, our guest tomorrow who is joining from the U.S., the East Coast. Mm -hmm. I won't name because I, I it, it's still a surprise for folks. Um, <laughs> so... We are hosting uh, the guest tomorrow at 7.30 p.m. Indian yeah. Standard Time. So it's going to okay. be 10 a.m. tomorrow morning for them. Wow, that's good. So, yeah, that, 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 that still works. I guess I'm, I'm going to be at e in the East Coast too. So that will be fine okay. for me as well. But I'm not <laughs> just thinking about all the West Coast people and three yes. hours behind. It's like, it oh. is kind of crazy. We actually had uh, an AMA recently with, the Jackie and uh, it, we did a thankfully it was a text-based AMA but it was yeah. very early morning for her and <laughs> very late in the night for us <laughs> so yeah. it, it gets a little tricky to find the right time but it's still I, I wonder, fun, you know? yeah oh yeah you, you always find a way I guess if you really want to do it you'll you'll wake up once in a couple of weeks just a little bit earlier than you you usually would I, I do wonder if like it would make more sense once you look at the west coast to do that early in your day and late in theirs right if there's like this little overlap that um you know like it's it's 10 10 p.m for them but uh what would that be like 7 a.m for you i, I can't do the yeah, math right now nine it, and it, a it's half kind of, hours. it's kind of difficult uh -huh. to uh, get all the it's easy to get one person to wake up at 7 30 a.m Right. Which is getting all the members to <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. So we oh, kind of request the uh, <laughs> just one day do that for us. It's oh, easier that's, than <laughs> that's true. Yeah, just ignore the idea. Just, <laughs> <laughs> just, just trying to experiment there. But yeah, it makes absolute sense. You don't want to like yeah. have a group of like what 20, 30, 40, 50 disgruntled people who haven't even had breakfast yet to uh, <laughs> ask interesting questions, right? Yeah, that's I bet yeah. that's complicated. Alrighty. Uh, we so, have um, 23 people. I think we can get started as more folks uh, join in. Join in. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Chanjunas, if you could start recording that. Sure, I'll do it straight away. So just in FYI, we are recording this and it's being live streamed uh, on YouTube as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah. all right, awesome. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is our episode five of 101 session and today we have Arvid Kahl with us and he is a software engineer turned entrepreneur and now very recently he's also an author. He's authored uh, two books. Uh, his recent book that's come out is uh, Embedded Entrepreneur. Before that he's written Zero to Soul. And currently he's building his startup Parmalink. And the best part about Arvid is he's very vocal about building in public, uh, as he was already mentioning that uh, he's very big on Twitter community. And that's why we wanted to get him here to talk about bootstrapping your startups from zero to one, how to make it big, how to get the right community, how to get the right audience. So without wasting any more time, uh, let's get started with the questions. Thank you for yeah, coming. Thanks. thanks so much for having me. I'm super excited. We're super excited to have you with us, Arvid. Uh, good evening, everyone who's joined us for this session, bootstrapping your startup to success. 
and good afternoon to folks who are joining us from germany hello and other time zones so i think just to the greeting uh, according to that we're very happy to have all of you join us so um arvi tell us a little bit about why you decided to write you were hmm. already a successful entrepreneur you sold at a very good um monthly recurring revenue um of an edtech startup so why did you decide to write uh, zero mm. to soul and your journey to it well um well i certainly didn't have to do anything that's uh, the consequence of selling a business is that you actually have a, a lot of space all of a sudden a lot of time on your hands and it felt to me um when we sold the business and the the business we sold was called feedback panda and it was a um, yeah an edtech productivity tool that my girlfriend and i we co-founded the company and we grew it to yeah $55,000 in monthly recurring revenue within 2 years and then sold the business and after we sold um all of a sudden we realized that we really really liked working and you know it's it's surprising but once once you have a business that is your own and everything that uh, any every kind of wealth that is generated in that business is yours then work feels much different than if you work for somebody else right if you could generate value for somebody else that's you know you don't really care but if everything that you create is for you well it's wonderful and you want to keep doing that and then we sell the business and all of a sudden what we once owned is now owned by somebody else and all the work that we love to do is now done by somebody else too and that just left this void this surprising void because i didn't think ever that i would feel like i really wanted to continue working you know like nobody really wants to you know when you have this all these opportunities you really want to um do whatever you want but it, it it turned out at that point what i wanted to do was to help people and that's what the business did right we were helping online teachers be more productive just to have a, an easier time making more money it's kind of what what our tool was all about and once somebody else was doing this for us and we were just sitting there here in this very apartment actually in this very room that's our office here um which is just a little like what is this like 5 by 5 meter room it's not the biggest place and with the pandemic this has been the only place that we've ever really been at it's in our apartment in berlin in germany we thought what are we going to do now and um we we had a little vacation that was fun and we tried to relax and i think Danielle my my partner she was more successful at that than I was because I just really wanted to do something again. That's when I decided, well, I wouldn't have come to this place. I wouldn't have been able to build and sell a bootstrap business if it wasn't for all the books and podcasts and interviews and learnings that I collected along the way prior to having started the business. Right? I was working as a software engineer for a company in Hamburg in Germany which is 3 hours away from Berlin and with a train I took the train multiple times a week and Germany doesn't have good cell reception on a train so I literally had nothing to do for you know, five ish hours every day and I filled it with podcasts and reading books and and audiobooks and all that stuff and I know I noticed that once we sold the business that I was literally standing on the shoulders of giants well figuratively i guess standing on the shoulders of giants because they had published all these amazing books and just shared what they knew with the community for free most of the time particularly on podcasts and on workshops and webinars and that kind of stuff and i thought okay if i like helping people and my saas business doesn't allow that anymore because it's not mine anymore well why not write why not share what i know with everybody and then i started a blog called the bootstrap founder which is still running i still write on it every single week and after a while people told me hey what you're writing is actually really cool and it seems to fit together and i was i was thinking okay yeah interesting i didn't think so i was just writing about everything i knew but people told me hey this you know it kind of seems connected and if i figured out it really was i just didn't intend to connect this stuff so i turned all of this into a little bootstrapping guide 25000 words um which was a, a lot of the stuff that i already had talked about and a lot of the stuff that i still wanted to talk about kind of mixed into some sort of compendium just writing like a like a blog post headline and just one paragraph of what i want to say in the blog post and that's kind of what most of the guide was yeah, essentially composed of and then somebody said hey if i could get this in print i would actually pay you money and that's when i realized oh i'm actually a writer apparently and i can actually turn this into a book So that's where the book came from. It was just a blog that I put out there because I wanted to share my knowledge and then people resonating with the blog and then telling me, "Hey, your writing is not that bad." And then I understanding that, "Okay, I'm not just a software engineer anymore or an entrepreneur. I actually seem to be a writer, so let's embrace it and turn it into a book." And I wrote the book 
and then I get got some editors and everything involved and put it on Amazon KDP, which um, sadly does not sell paperback copies in India just yet, which is really frustrating because Amazon has this global reach and their KDP system is it's the Kindle, what's it called? Kindle distribution platform, something like that. You can put eBooks up there and you could can put print on demand books up there, but only for the US and Germany and France and Italy and these, these kind of Western markets, which is super annoying because I, I know for a fact that a lot of people in India really, really want to get paperback versions of books, obviously. So one of the things that I'm not too happy with in this whole thing is that India is so, yeah, I d- disregard it in that, in that, um, that, that sense. But for that, I have Gumroad and eBooks and stuff and people still seem to enjoy those. So that's fine. But yeah, I've self-published, which is why I'm, I'm saying this right now, because it's not just that I wrote a book. I also published it myself. I didn't go through a publisher or anything because I felt, hey, I want to see if what if an info product, a book, is the same thing as a bootstrapped software business, if it, if it can actually be done the same way. Because in the book, I talk about how to build a software business or how to build a bootstrap business. And I, I, while writing the book, I figured, hey, this is very similar the, the process of writing to the process of building a startup. And in the end, it turned out to be the exact same thing. Like you need an audience that you want to serve. You need, they need to have a problem. You need to solve it. And then you build a product that meets the, the criteria that your customers want to use. And there's no difference between a software product and a book or in a course or anything like it. If, if you do these steps in that order, you're going to have a highly successful or high, uh, product with a high chance of success. Let's just say that. There's, there's no guarantees in bootstrapping or entrepreneurship to begin with. But yeah, that's how the book came together. Sorry for going on all these tangents, but that's just how my brain works. So just pull me back to your questions if you need me to. That's, that's how Zero to Salt got started. I think that makes a lot of sense and um, because we have Indian, uh, the ecosystem, the startup ecosystem, it is seeing a boom in Mm -hmm. so many different kinds of startups that are coming about. You have healthcare, edutech, um, different models in healthcare, different models in edutech, you have agrotech, now you have space tech. So I think what you're saying definitely um, resonates that it needs to be principle based. Yeah. rather than a particular edu tech or some particular SaaS tech. Yes. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Sure. Um, with your second book, The Embedded Entrepreneur, you ran several of your manuscript versions with almost 500 alpha readers. Mm-hmm. How did you come about <laughs> building in public with your book, which is really unheard of? Right. Well, um what I wanted to do was to dive really deeply into this whole audience first audience building approach. That's, that's kind of why I wanted to write the book because that was the one thing in zero to sold in my first book where people said, I want to know more about this. Or that that's what most people that read the book said, this is great. This is really helpful. And I want to know more about this particular part. And that's usually the start, right? It's always, if you want to do something, you need to know where to start and how to do it right. So that the first steps that you take, are actually the most foundational and most secure steps along the way. Because if you have wrongful assumptions and if you choose the wrong, I don't know, like audience or product or whatever, and you spend five years trying to do this and you fail after that, well, that's five years lost. Right? You might just as well try to get it um, good or at least as good as possible from the start. And that's what I wanted to talk about. And that's what I said on Twitter. So essentially, the book started with a tweet. I want to write about audience first. Um, I also had a little landing page where I just put all the the kinds of um, topics that I wanted to write about in the book because I I gave it a couple of days thought and made a little outline, put that on a landing page. And then I told people on Twitter, hey, here's this book that I want to write. This is what I want to write about. If this is not enough for you, here's a comment field. Tell me what you also want me to write about in this book. That's how I started. The whole thing started right there in public on Twitter because I thought this book is about building an audience first product why not write the book in an audience first way as well right if the book is proof that the content of the book works then it's like it just makes a lot of sense because why would i not do it in public when i say that the best products happen when you build them in public with the audience right so that's kind of where this came from and then from the tweet came a lot of responses for people telling me what they wanted me to write about. And then I sat down and and wrote the actual first draft within a month, January of 2021, the whole month. It was a 
an intense month, but it was fun. And then I took the first manuscript, the first version, the first draft of the book, and I immediately shared it with, I think it must have been 50 some people on that first day at once it was out uh, on a platform called helpthisbook.com, which is run by Rob Fitzpatrick, who you might know as the author of The Mom Test and now a book called Useful Books. Um, uh, which is about writing books that are useful. But he wrote The Mom Test, which is a book about how to talk to your customers without them telling you the things that they think you want to hear, which is the, the essence of the title. And um, yeah, that he has a platform because he also uses a lot of beta readers in his books. So he built a tool, you know, typical serial entrepreneur, do a thing, learn something that doesn't really work while you do the thing. And then once the thing is done, you now go to that problem and you solve that and you learn something new and you solve that problem and you learn something new. It's just this, this iteration over just problems that you find um, wherever you go. And Rob has been doing this. And that's kind of what I've been doing too, right? I solve a problem for online teachers. I learn a lot. And then I see oh, all other founders also want to know how to build this. Then I tell them and I learn a lot. And I notice, okay, building in public apparently is a good way. And then I teach people that. And then I learn. It's just this never-ending cycle of new interesting challenges. And yeah, that's, that's how the first draft got exposed to 50 some people. And then they gave me feedback on the platform. I worked it into the second draft and I just invited another... I think it must have been a hundred people at that point. I had an email list, which was also on my landing page for the book. And people just signed up as alpha readers because there's there's nothing easier or or more exciting, I guess, than getting access to a book for free before it's out. Because you get access to the full knowledge of the book. It might be a bit raw and not well formulated, right? It might still have a couple typos in there and a couple of, I don't know, consistency issues maybe, but it's still 97% of the full knowledge that you would get in the final product. So if you get that for free and the only thing you have to do is maybe say, hey, this part sucked, like who doesn't love to criticize other people, right? Who is not enjoying that? So it's it's a win-win, obviously. And people really liked it. And I did that like three, four times involved. At, at the end, it must have been 550 people who gave me a lot of their opinions. There was a lot of thoughts and a lot of very conflicting opinions, which is always a problem if you're building in public. One person thinks this and the other person thinks the complete opposite and they're both right. And it's super complicated and you kind of have to navigate that, but it's just how it works. And um, yeah, people, essentially I collaboratively edited the book with 550 other people. And then once it was at a stage where I thought, hey, this is good enough because I, I don't believe in perfect. I, I think perfect is the enemy of all progress, like in any capacity, if it's 80, 90, some percent of what you wanted it to be, it's already much more than what most other people are capable of. So might just as well, right? And then I gave it to a final, an editor and a proofreader had some professional look into this. And then I had another book and then I, I launched it. And because so many people were involved in the process of making this book happen, like from day one, from this first tweet in must have been October or maybe even September last year, like 2020, um, people were so excited to have been along this whole journey of me writing this essentially in public that the launch day was just insane. I, it was in, in the best sense of the word. I, like, I did not expect this. Thousands of people like so bought the book and retweeted my tweet, uh, hundreds of them, and people really, really engaged with it and tried to help me because my success was their success. Because if you do something with other people, you have some sort of collective identity. And if some, if, if you can help somebody else in your group, and we're already getting kind of ahead of what I want to talk about later today, but if you are in a community and indie hackers, indie founders, that, that is a community on Twitter and wherever you go, if one person in the community wins and you all share this common bond, then you win too, just a little bit. So you can, you would do everything in your power to help this person win because you win as well. And that's how I felt this reciprocity in that, in that moment. People really, really wanted to help me because they just like to see me succeed because we're all a team in a way. And that's, that's this, this whole hundreds of people co-editing a book. I think it's novel, but I think we will see much more of this in the future. And if you read Rob Fitzpatrick's new book, like useful books, writing useful books. Don't really know the, the, the title, but that's kind of where it is. Um, he will tell you, involve beta readers from the beginning. I was actually a beta reader of Rob's book while I was writing my book. So, you know, it's this whole meta cycle of people helping each other, either with knowledge or with editing or just opinions. And we will see a lot more in self-publishing people who involve communities from the start in the books that they're writing. Because honestly, how can you not want that? Because my people on Twitter that I follow and that follow me, 
Those are my future readers. And those are the people that decide, will I read this book or will I not read this book? Why wouldn't I involve them from the start? Why wouldn't I have them tell me, do you understand this at any part of the way? Because the end result of what I wanted to write was a book that was super pragmatic and actionable. I didn't want to write the, the book that is super thinky and academic about, oh, yes, we should do business that particular way. It's really, that, that is great. These books are wonderful if you are looking at more intellectual stuff. But if you really want to build a business today and you want to learn about how you can find and build an audience today, intellectual stuff won't cut it. You need like step-by-step -step instructions. You need attempts, experiments, and that stuff. So it was really nice to see my future readers resonating with what I was writing as I was writing it. And that's why I did it. Wow. I think we've already found the golden nugget number one from the conversation <laughs> that build in public or build with your audience. Don't build in isolation, especially when you're gonna, when you're building it for the others. All right. So, um, why is building a company or a product the bootstrapped way important and how can one go about it? Hmm. Well, um, it's it's important if you want to build it the bootstrap way. Like, let me let me kind of preface that with there are many, many ways of building a business and all of them are kind of cool. <laughs> you know, all of them are fine. Like you can get millions of dollars or rupees or whatever and put them into like a VC backed, super hyperscale, hyper growth business. If that's you, you, what you want to do, if you want to be beholden to investors and the, the kind of expectations that they have, if you think you can strike it rich as one of the thousands that try, go for it. But there is the risk of not being the, the one in a thousand or one in a hundred that does it, that makes it and being one in the 99 or in the 999 that fail. And I don't want to be that person necessarily. It's just not my, my risk tolerance. I would rather see a hundred out of a hundred people succeeding enough to make a dent in their life to get to financial security or at least financial stability. You don't need to be a billionaire to enjoy your life. You, you might not even need to be a millionaire to enjoy your life. It certainly helps, but you know, you, you don't need to, to go for the stars and be like in the, in the top 0.01% to have a good life. Just having enough money to pay, I don't know, the rent or a mortgage or the food for the family and for a couple of vacations once a year, you know, a good, nice car or whatever you need. That is good enough. The lifestyle business is about having a choice in what life you need. And if you choose to live a minimal life of not wasting much time, not wasting much money and spending it a lot with family, bootstrapping a business is a really good idea, at least at a point. Like bootstrapping will mean you have to work a lot. So if you want to spend a lot of time with your family, you may just, just want to get a job or something. But in the beginning, at least, right, getting a business up to this level where you can employ other people and where you can get outside help to stabilize it, where you might even replace yourself in the business and just own it but have other people do the work, that takes some time to get there, but it's possible. And the great thing about bootstrapping is that if you approach it from this audience-centric way, and I was kind of hinting at it in the beginning, right? You look at who you want to serve, who's going to be your audience, you find a critical problem, you try to solve it in a way that fits into their workflow, and then you then you build a product. The product is last. It's not the first, it's the last. Um, then you build a product that happens to, to work within the medium that they already use solutions in. That is a pretty solid, easily verifiable, or at least validatable approach to building a business. And that's usually the opposite of how VC-funded, like highly monetized businesses work, because they want the moonshot. They want the crazy idea that nobody believes in, that nobody thinks could ever work and then you make it happen and then you have the whole market and then you explode in value and then they are happy then they make millions and you make millions and everybody thinks you're the greatest that's kind of the approach that vc has that's how, how vc works right they they just have to hope for the one that goes hyper growth and pays for all the other 99 or 999 people who don't bootstrapping is different every bootstrap business is in itself a unit of success. Like if you bootstrap your business to, I don't know, for um, in, in Germany, I don't know, you, you probably need 5,000 euros or dollars a month to sustain a normal life. If your bootstrap business has a 95% margin and you make $6,000 MRR, you're already, already there. You're already there. You don't need more than $6,000 coming in a month if you're the only person running the business. 
and it has this high margin. And of course you have expenses and stuff, so it might need to make double or whatever, but you don't need millions coming in a month. You just need some money for your lifestyle business. And that's why bootstrapping is such an interesting choice for every single founder, because the people you compete with are not other founders with crazy ideas. The people you compete with are people in the market that already are there or that might join. And you don't need the full market. So competition is actually fine. Competition is a normal part of building a bootstrap business because you will never, very unlikely at least, grab the whole market in, in itself. Like Uber is doing, well, there's Lyft, right? But who, who cares? Like, like what Uber is doing with that market or what um, Google is doing with the search market of Microsoft, sorry. But, you know, like it, it, it's, it's almost a joke to mention the second one to mention the runner up in these markets because there's just such a domination by the by the monopolist or amazon or whatever right you you see the those people are just gigantic and then there's these tiny little um yeah uh, small businesses around it that try to hope to get a piece of the market but in many smaller markets smaller fields niches i guess you have a lot of competitors just sitting beside each other not really grabbing much of each other's market share because they're specialized and bootstrap businesses to come to an end here are specialized businesses. You're not gonna in, invent a, um, a product that is good for everybody if you're a bootstrap business. Like even the bigger bootstrap businesses, and I'm looking at JetBrains, which make um, IDEs, like the development environments, they have a very specific niche, which is software engineers that work for larger businesses that need complicated uh, development systems, or um, I, I don't know what's what's another big bootstrap business, um, ConvertKit, I guess, are they still bootstrap? Like email, but email for bloggers, email for very specific people. Like even they, even these businesses that now make millions, buffer, whatever, they go into really specific markets. And that's what the bootstrap business is about. Because I, like I said, you find your audience and then you detect their problems. And then you take the one problem that they have the biggest, biggest issues with, because it's critical. And the critical problem usually has a budget. People want to pay money to get rid of a critical problem, right? So if you build a bootstrap business that focuses on that one particular problem, well, if somebody else builds a similar product, but goes into a completely different market and targets and a similar problem by com somebody completely different, you're never going to intersect. Your product is never going to be bought by them and their product is never going to be bought by your people. And it's crazy because you have your market, you can grow your business, they have their market, they can grow their business. And that's the benefit of, of bootstrap businesses. They're niche focused, they're critical problem focused, and they don't need hyper growth. They don't need money to, to invest in marketing that reaches the whole continent or the whole country. Well, you don't need to reach the whole country if you know exactly who, where and who your audience is. Right. If you know, okay, and that's maybe sorry for another tangent here, but Feedback Panda, the business we founded, the the target niche that we um, were selling for was online English teachers um, that speak that spoke English natively or still do, I guess, teaching online through browsers for Chinese companies, and they were teaching English as a second language to Chinese children. That's the specificity of the niche that we were targeting. Right? There were there was no no like bio biology teachers, not a part of it. They were not brick and mortar regular school teachers, not a part of it. They were not teaching for Japanese companies, they were teaching for Chinese companies. And that's the specificity in which we still built a solid, like what is it, $600,000 ARR business just from that market. And we were not even expanding because we just didn't need to. Right? There was still a lot of space in that market. And there still is, to be honest, if you're interested. So um, the, that's, that's what bootstrapping does. It allows you to focus, really laser focus on one specific niche and execute the best you can for those people who you hopefully understand, which we can talk about later, and then build a business that is unencumbered by competition because you're just doing well for this niche and nobody else is. And even if there's somebody else, you can always niche down or up. There's, there's lots of ways. Bootstrapping is wonderful. And it allows you, like it did for us and many, many others, to reach financial security because the value of such a business is very interesting if it is a software as a service business in particular. Because a SaaS business, and that's, that's how we were acquired, people look at SaaS businesses as things that they can take and put other people in and continue running. Like the company we sold to, SureSwift Capital, is a Canadian US uh, private equity business or private equity uh, yeah, fund or company. And they have 30 some SaaS businesses just like ours that they run. They bought them, they put new people in and they keep running and growing those businesses. 
because they're so easily run and grown because all good SaaS businesses are essentially structured the same way, highly automated, well-documented, and um, you can really run them with overlapping teams because they all have a tech part, they have a marketing part, they have, uh, you know, finances and stuff, and you can consolidate this. And if you build your business in a, in a sellable way, which um, I learned by reading the book Built to Sell by John Warlow and the book The, the E-Myth by um, Michael E. Gerber, I guess, and both of them heavily influenced what I was writing out about as well. If you build your business in a sellable way, when somebody wants to buy it, you can easily sell it to them, right? Because you built it that way. And then you sell it, and then you don't need to work anymore. Then you could choose to do whatever you want, like writing books or being on Twitter all day. And that's really nice. And you, you don't really get to do this with a venture-backed business either. And I don't want to like waste too much time on this. I'm, I'm going to be done in a couple of seconds here. But if you are... Um, the CEO of a venture-backed business, there, there are expectations in your future. People want you to go to the next round. They want you to go to the round after that. They want you to hit growth goals. They want you to hire and hire and build and get the market. Like You can't just say, oh, no, I don't want to do this anymore. Because these expectations, they are stretching long into your future. With bootstrapping, really not the case. Like If you want to continue running your business, just do it. Hire somebody to work with you, maybe hire somebody to replace you completely and just count the money that comes in every month. Or if you want to sell it, sell it, or sell a part of it maybe and just keep working in it. Or, you know, there's so many opportunities because it's it's not this gigantic hyper growth expectation. You can do pretty much whatever you want with that business. And I'm going to end it here. Awesome. Like that whole answer itself was awesome. I'm so glad there are a few more things that I do want to touch about. So uh, we'll just uh, move on to the next question. Uh, you've talked about uh, bootstrapping in the terms of why it is important and how people mm -hmm. can do it. What are the common misconceptions? Like when people look at a bootstrap business, what are the most common misconceptions that you've come across mm. that people think bootstrap business have? Well, and one, one I already kind of hinted at, like that a lifestyle business, um, that that's usually is a negative connotation. Right? When people hear lifestyle business, they say, ah, it's like ah, sitting on the beach and, you know, as if that is a problem, right? Isn't it great that people can actually choose what life they lead? Isn't that something that as a society we would want to encourage? That's sitting one of on the misconceptions. Beach and working should be a plus. <laughs> yeah, right. Like the fact that you actually want to do what you're doing that is act quite rare in, in, the, in the professional working environment. Many people just feel like they're forced to go through these, I don't know, career ladders to get to a point where they're financially stable enough to do to raise a family or you know to, to get to whatever place they want to get to. If you can actually do this and you have decided that you don't need to live the luxury life, you don't need like a golden car. I don't know if that is what people do. I have no idea. But you, you don't need it, right? Obviously, it's it's not a necessity. A necessity is having a, a, a yeah, being able to wake up whenever you want to wake up. That already is a wonderful thing. And having a clear schedule, it's even better. Like having an empty calendar, it's like mm, the best. Like if that is what you want, you can accomplish that. And if you accomplish that with a business that doesn't make more than, I don't know, $20,000 a month, which is already a lot of money, what, why would that be a bad thing? Why would you need to even grow further than that, right? If that is paying for what you're doing and you always have the chance to sell the business. So it's not that you if you give it up, it's going nowhere. If you give it up, you just sell it to somebody for, I, I would assume, what is that? Like um, 250,000 a year to double that, maybe three times. That's almost a million dollars that you can sell it for, right? Maybe half a million, a million, it's still a lot of money. So there's value in that. And I, I don't see why this is a problem. So common misconception number one, lifestyle business is bad. It's not, it's actually amazing. And it gives you the, the freedom to choose how you spend your time, which particularly when you're young, somewhere in your twenties or early thirties, and you start to raising children, which I'm not, but I've seen a lot of people do this. It is awesome to be able to be there. It's to be there with the kids while you work on something that actually contributes to their college fund, right? It's, it's wonderful. It's, it's just something that gives you a lot of opportunity while being in a job where you have to work 45, 50, 60 hours a week and none of the value that you capture is actually yours. You know, it's a, it's a trade-off in, in many ways. I actually wrote about this a couple of weeks ago. Like, you, of course, if you have a job, you have a cap downside, right? You can, um, you can rely on the fact that if you're good at what you're doing, nobody will kick you out and you will get this constant stream of money, but you also have a, con a capped upside. You will never receive any more than a 
bit of a bonus maybe in your business or in, in the job from that business. The actual value that you create goes to the people owning the business. And then once you build your own business, you have an unlimited upside. You could build the biggest, one most wonderful business that you can, but you also have unlimited downside. You can, you know, like if the business fails, then you have nothing. So there's always risk involved in these things. And maybe that's one thing to, to just really stress at this point. Risk is always part of entrepreneurship. No matter how well designed the approach is that you're taking, and I recommend a more validation-focused approach, but it's still risky. Right? It, it, it's never without risk. If you even if you validate that your audience is there, the people you want to help are there and they have a critical problem and they have a budget and you have a solution, could be that at the time you launch your product, the next day somebody else launches the exact same product, much cheaper, and you're completely out of business. Could happen. It can always happen. You never know. But the chances fairly low because most people go idea first and they build something that nobody wants. So it's always good, but you know, there's always risk in business and that's, that's an important part. And that's maybe also a misconception is that bootstrapping is a completely risk-free approach. It's not, you, it's still your money on the line and you still have to make sure that even if you bootstrap, you still have to follow the right steps to get to, to someplace, right? It just because you're saying, Oh, I'm bootstrapping and I'm doing whatever I want. That's not how business works either. You still have to use solid, fundamental validation approaches all along the way to make sure that the people you're serving have a problem and that you can actually solve the problem with a product that you can actually physically or digitally create. So that's another thing. Next and last common misconception here is that bootstrapping means not taking any funding at all. You can still take funding if you're a bootstrapper. It's just that the funding itself is different. And I'm an investor, I think I have to say this, in the Calm Fund, um, it was called Earnest Capital until a couple of months ago, but they had to rename or they did rename. Um, and this is a bootstrapper focused fund. So the, what the Calm Fund does is they, they get bootstrappers in and they give them, I don't know, somewhere between 10 and 50, maybe $100,000 max that really did, those are the big ones, for things that they need right now. They don't take equity. They just have a, an, a, a revenue sharing or a shared earnings agreement. The idea is that if the bootstrapper makes money beyond a certain cap, I don't know, 10,000 in earnings that, that would go to the, the founder, anything above, they get 10% forever or until a certain amount, like double the investment or something is reached or until there is an equity round. And then the, the, their stake that they have with the shared earnings agreement converts into equity, which is nice because it means you don't have to do equity. They are perfectly happy by just getting part of your revenue that you make with your business on a monthly basis back into the fund. And that to me is a, and that's why I joined there as an investor is because I love this alignment because as a bootstrapper, I don't want investors that have different goals than I have. I want investors that first of they understand what I'm doing as a bootstrapper and as a software entrepreneur, that is important. And Tyler, funny enough, he also sold a business to SureSwift Capital, the same company that we sold it to. Like it's it's like that's how we got connected initially. Tyler Tringas is the name if you want to look him up on on Twitter, and um and Calm Fund like I think at Calm Fund would be the uh, the name of the fund. So he understands software engineers, but he also understands bootstrappers, and he doesn't want them to ever really go for venture capital uh, money. But he knows that sometimes you just need twenty thousand dollars for your first hire or for some marketing campaign that you want to run. Or I don't know, to keep the, the lights on during a pandemic, you know, you have, there's all these reasons why a bootstrap business could take a bit of money. And that there are funding sources for this is a really good thing. You see this with Tiny Seed that's run by Rob Walling, the, the person behind MicroConf and uh, a lot of uh, other the, the, the Startups for the Rest of Us podcast, which I highly recommend, particularly the latest episode. I think it is what, 555 or something? He's 500 episodes into a podcast, which is crazy. It's about uh, investing for founders. That is, the, I, I recommend listening to this and every other episode of the podcast, obviously. But he runs Tiny Seed, which is also an accelerator for bootstrap businesses. So they put some money into the bootstrap businesses. They and they mentor these businesses. They keep them together and then they help them together as a group, as a cohort to be better at bootstrapping. And so you don't need to say, oh, bootstrapping is just my own money or my grandma's money or, you know, like a, a, somebody else, um, co-founder's money or something. There are funding ways out there that don't involve venture capital. 
this is the first time i've uh, honestly i'll be honest i thought bootstrapping businesses don't take funds so that was one misconception that you've definitely <laughs> cleared for me uh, i'm glad you touched upon the audience part of it and this is a question i've been uh, waiting to ask you uh, <laughs> because uh, this i'm very excited about bootstrap founders also have to build audience it's yes. majority of the times it's audience first approach but how do you go about building your audience and finding the right audience for a very niche product that you're building so that's a very tricky thing to do with mm-hmm. being very frugal at the same time because you don't have yeah. a lot of runway of money to spend so how does one go about building the audience the fortunate thing about niches is that there's usually community there's usually a community or many communities in every niche like yeah I, i don't really i don't think i need to give examples but like look at the software engineering community and the stack overflow and the, the forums out there and twitter and um, the, all all these sub communities all these um interesting little slack instances that exist right i i'm part of the elixir slack because i'm an elixir engineer and that is like thousands of people that have no real connection other than coding in the same language exchanging information every single day and if you're building a tool for this community if you're building a tool for this niche well the first and best thing you should do is to be part of the community and that's what the embedded entrepreneurship approach is all about right um i find it interesting that you say i'm building an audience for a niche tool that you're that you that you're building i think this might be the wrong way around because you want to be part of an audience and part of a community to understand what their problems are and then build the tool they really need obviously reality and like the optimal situation are often like quite quite far apart but that is the approach that i suggest in the embedded entrepreneur is like figure out okay who can i help and i'm just going to give you a really quick um crash course in in this audience discovery um part of this uh, this multi step approach but you want to discover your audience you want to explore your audience you want to discover their problems and then you want to build a product with and for your audience those are the four steps really that are in the book as well and audience discovery is all about figuring out who do i want to help and which of those many many people that i would likely be able to help which is the right group because i'm a software engineer i'm a writer i'm a bootstrapper i'm a twitch watcher i'm a podcaster i'm i do love tea i do love coffee and i really like showering for half an hour all of these things are kind of communities or audiences at least potential audiences for something right obviously very different things like the shower people probably wouldn't need a software product that much but maybe they would need a better shower head or something i don't know but it it just matters that you try to in this very first step explore your life yourself and your surroundings for things that make you think of audiences potential target audiences that you might want to help and i i usually say look at your own life your professional life look at your hobbies look at your spouse what what are they doing right my daniel my my partner that i co-founded the business with she's an opera singer so now all of a sudden i have artists and singers as my potential audiences because as a software engineer myself no problem i can build a job board for opera singers right that's technically one of the easiest things that i could do is build a little piece of software that helps people do a particular thing so by looking into our relationships that we have we can easily find interesting niches that wouldn't come to mind immediately if you were to ask me who do you want to help but they are definitely there and just look at how fit the panda happened daniel was teaching english online and i was sitting right next to her and i i just saw how she hated doing student feedback and if if i if you had asked me a couple months before that i would never have thought of helping english online teachers with a software product but by just thinking about it and being exposed to the problem it was clear that this was a potential audience for building a, a, a solution to a problem so make this big list look around you look at actually quite physically look around you i see a microphone i see a computer so we have podcasters voice actors people who build software people who do do meetings like you know there's all these things and i i would also say i see guitars so there's artists so or guitar players or musicians that that could be an interesting audience because i am a really bad guitar player so maybe i can help other people that play even worse which is hard to bet get better at this with some kind of software that i might build or info product that i might share with them right so that's the first part try to get as many things onto a list potential audiences and then you start ranking them because we all love data driven approaches to making decisions at least i do but i think most people actually like to have some sort of 
logic behind their choices. And then you rank them for how much do I actually like these people? Because I love writers. I love bootstrappers. I kind of like guitar players, but by far not as much as I love to would love to work for more for bootstrappers or for founders. And once you start ranking these people, you see, okay, this could be a potentially interesting audience, but I don't want to work for them. And honestly, if you have to work for a group of people for five or 10 years, because that's how long it might take for you to build your business, you better like them. Because wouldn't, it, wouldn't, it would really suck if you would have to help people, even though you don't like them for years, a decade. So that's a big part, affinity. How much affinity do you feel? That's the first ranking. And then you just really look into these places, into these communities, to just do a cursory search, maybe 10, 20 minutes for each of your audiences, and you look for opportunity. Is there, are, are there people complaining a lot about problems in that field? Or are people super happy and they don't care, right? And then you rank for, is there opportunity in this field? And then you look for appreciation. Do they have budgets for software? Because there are some fields where people have problems, but they don't want to spend money. Like, um, yeah, certain hobbies. People love hobbies, but they won't pay much money for it unless it's something tangible that's useful to them. But if the only thing you can do is build software in a world where people don't use software much, you have to really convince them to pay money for your software product. So there's not much appreciation, right? So you rank for that somewhere between zero to five or whatever you want to rank it for. And the final thing is you look at the size of the market. Not too big, not too small. Kind of the Goldilocks zone. Because if you're a bootstrapper, you don't want too big of a market. Like I said earlier, right? When, you have, when you're competing with Microsoft or with Amazon or with Google, yeah, they have like their ad spend a month is in the billions. You probably have $20. It's not the same, right? This is really not the same. So you want a smaller market, big enough to sustain you and a couple other people, but small enough not to immediately invite this competition. And then you add up the numbers and you sort by the final number. And then you see, okay, this is the most likely audience for me where I like them. There's opportunity in the field. They actually have budgets for stuff and the market is big enough for me. And that's your audience discovery process. That's kind of where you take all of these, it's a reflective um, exercise in the beginning, and then it becomes a, an analytic exercise afterwards. And you end up with a list of interesting audiences. And that's kind of where you start. Then you go into these communities, you pick the, the top audience or whichever one you like most out of that list, I guess top one would be best, but you know, and then you go into that community and you listen, you observe, you, you just sit there and you figure out, okay, what do people talk about? What's the day-to-day -day like? What are the problems that they talk about so much that if they really stand out, what words do they use? What language do they use? You start engaging with the community. You start building up yourself as a person that is actually interested in them. You know, you don't have to be an expert. Any expert that is an expert now was just an ambitious learner at some point. Be an ambitious learner. Learn about what they, what they care about. Learn about the people in the community. And over time, you will be the expert. Because you're the person that is there listening and engaging with people. You don't have to produce content. You just have to be there and talk to people. Like humans, you know, like actual human beings that communicate with each other. And if you can do that, you will learn so much about this community that then you can go to the next step, which is problem discovery, where you can start methodically ranking the problems you encounter in the community, right? People complain about stuff. They ask for alternatives. They ask for recommendations or they ask for help. And one of these four, either one is interesting, just depends on how much work you want to do convincing them that they actually have a problem, right? If people complain, they usually don't even know that they have a problem. If people ask for recommendations, they know they have a problem, but they don't know what the solutions are. If they ask for alternatives, they know that there are solutions out there. They just don't know which one is the right one. And um, if they, if they um, ask for help, then they're somewhere in between understanding that they have a problem and knowing that there's a solution. So there's like a, there's a ladder. I kind of gave the wrong order. It's like one, four, three, two or something that I just said, but you know, it's in the book. Huh? So that would help. The idea is you can source this information from within the community by just listening to what they say and then engaging with people if you need more information. Right? Somebody is saying, oh, I'm, I'm having so much trouble getting this weird video file exported into something that works with tool XYZ. Well, just talk to them. Well, ha what have you tried? Like, have you, have you tried like exporting it as this and then importing it like that or whatever? Once you're in the community, you will understand why people have challenges and you will be able to figure out where those exact pain points are. And then you can think about, okay, now I can solve this. Now I know exactly where the problems are and I know that they are already paying for a really shitty product that kind of helps them. I can build a much better, much more laser-focused product. I can charge probably even more and it's going to be awesome. 
I just need to talk to people. And that talking to people, this getting feedback, and that kind of harks back to the embedded entrepreneur when I did the feedback with this community of readers, that feedback is where the actual value comes from. Because if you're part of a community, people are open. They will be honest with you, right? They will tell you what they think without thinking you're some kind of spy or you're some kind of intruder, which every community is super wary of. They, If you look at Reddit, if you do any advertisement on Reddit, they're just going to kick you out of the subreddit because they hate it. They hate when people come in there and destroy their community by just like throwing their stuff in there. So if you want to build this kind of reputation as an expert on Reddit, you should never do any marketing until the point where people understand that you're one of them. And then you can do very careful and very like um, relational marketing with people, but still you have to be careful because communities hate when you market to them without helping them, right? If you, I, I can't call this the, the selfish um, self-promotion. Their selfless self-promotion is when you help a community by telling them, hey, I made this for you. And their selfish self-promotion is when you just go into a community and say, hey, I made this, buy this, right? That is selfish. That doesn't help them. That's just about you making money. But if you do selfless self-promotion and say, if you do something for other people, they're much more open to actually helping you and accepting you as part of the community. And from there, from within that community, you learn about their problem, you solve it with your product, and then you have this feedback cycle consistently ongoing, best if you're building in public, sharing your, your progress that you are making with the product, with your community. And I did that with the book. You can do that with a SaaS business. I've seen that quite a lot on Twitter with people building, building SaaS businesses. Best example would be Noah Bragg building Potion, which is a, a Notion to website converter. He's been very vocal about this product and the community has been extremely supportive and helpful with him. I think without that community, he wouldn't have been number one product of the week on, on Product Hunt with this thing. Like I, it kind of annoys me because I'm number two product of the week and I really don't like it, but it's fine. You know, Noah's great and I, I really like the guy and I, I wish him the very best. Number one of the month would have been even better, but you know, uh, I'm happy for him, but I'm more happy even for everybody around him because here's the community around the product and the founder, a journey, a story, and everybody really enjoys that. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a unifying and uplifting thing. It's empowering. People see, I can do this too, right? And that's why... This, this approach is so helpful um, with, the, with the whole community audience building and, and audience building in, in specific. I'm just going to close this here with a couple hints at how to build an audience because that's what most people probably are interested in. Audience building to me is helping other people. It's not about saying, hey, I'm great. It's more like, hey, here I am. And there's the other guy. He's awesome. Or there's this founder. She's doing an amazing job. Like that is that is what I do. I try to engage with people and empower them as much as possible because that's how I feel. I would like to see more people interact with each other. And that seems to attract a lot of people who feel the same way. So I'm having an audience of, I must've been a 26,000 followers. I don't really count. What I count is the cool interactions that I have every single day. And I have a lot of interesting interactions every day on Twitter. So that's where, that's where this is coming from. And it's not because I have incredibly smart content or super quotable tweets. It's not me. Other people do that. I do not. But what I do is to retweet a lot what other people do. I help people when I can. I pull in people into conversations when other people need their help. And I just try to connect the community. And that is how you can build an, an audience anywhere by just being a person that contributes to the community by unifying the community, by helping the people in the community, by supporting the efforts that are already made in the community. And that's how you build an audience, like in the, the shortest of versions. The, in the book, I think it's 150 pages, but I was trying to condense it. Great. That, that's a lot of insights packed into a very small uh, phrase at the end. Uh, you were talking about alpha uh, readers. Uh, mm -hmm. I just wanted to bring this up because uh, my, you just kind of validated our idea in a way. We run this thing called Alpha Users Program, where we mm. connect founders with uh, their audience, kind of their product enthusiasts who want to test yeah. out their features and give them feedback while they're building the product. So we mm. are kind of running this program right now and listening to you was, I was just kind of, you know, validating <laughs> that idea with it as well. So uh, thanks nice. for that. Uh, well, cool. Yeah. So while bootstrapping, most founders would probably build most of the things themselves or maybe have mm. a co-founder at the most. Yeah. Uh, hiring is very limited. Uh, but 
how different is hiring for a bootstrap business versus let's say somebody who's vc backed or is completely funded how mm. different is the approach in terms of hiring and what are the difficulties that they face because let's say uh, for a vc funded startup uh, hiring might be tad bit easy uh, selling mm. the product is much easier for them uh, versus somebody who's bootstrapped so if you could shed some light on that well hiring is hard i i like no matter where you go hiring is hard and honestly that's also the one of the mistakes that i made during feedback panda going to be quite honest here also the reason why i had a lot of mental health issues um, in our business because it was really just in and i like we we were the co-founders we were running the business and we never really hired during our time our two years running the business and it was it was um, way too late that i noticed that i should have hired because i was the technical founder i was dealing with anything technical like all the um the bugs of the product maintenance problems like server downtime uh, if people had data issues i needed to fix that and we had 5000 customers at that point and it was just two of us and i needed to fix every single problem it was bizarre and i thought ah well i could probably hire a, a software engineer but uh, i don't have enough work for them to work full time so i better don't hire anybody at all i don't know why my brain did this to me but i was considering that any job that we would hire for should be a full time position or nothing at all of course there is a lot in between right there is people just doing project work there is people doing part time work people doing retainer work there's a lot of different opportunities for, to to get people to work on your thing without paying them a full time salary but i was thinking oh because i come from this world i come i, I worked for a vc funded um, business back then and for um, more regular traditional businesses that were hiring like normal businesses regular jobs right 40 hours a week kind of jobs and i thought no I'm not going to hire until there's enough work for a full-time job. And that was stupid. Like quite literally the most stupid thing I did because it did cause a lot of damage. It, it gave me severe anxiety, I have a lot of like physical stuff that I'm still working through 2 years after. It's it's the worst. It's just it just really sucks. So what I would recommend is that you as a as a bootstrap founder, you look into the non-traditional hiring. You look into hiring people on a on a, on a project basis. You look into hiring people on a part-time basis, even if, if it's a software engineer, if it is a customer service person or something, you hire them for, I don't know, the, the four hours that you, in, the, in the afternoon that you want to spend time with your family, right? You don't need to hire them for eight hours a day. You can hire them for Friday afternoon, where it's family night or something. You can be flexible because you have full control over your business. You also have full control over who works for your business. So hiring is different because it's not this traditional you know we have seven roles and we need seven people to come 40 hours a week uh, starting on monday ending on friday you need to work also on the weekend because a bootstrap business nobody will be there if you're not working on it so you might also need to hire people that have like a little time window on the weekend to maybe allow you to work on other things or to take some time with your family so hiring is important i did it way too late we did it when we actually transitioned the company and what i thought was so scary was really not that scary because we talked to people and they said, yeah, I would like to do that. And then we gave them money and then they did the thing. I think it's really not that surprising, but I, I always, uh, I never hired before. It's also a big, big deal for me, I guess, at that moment, because I was always the one who was hired, never the one who did the hiring. So I had no experience and having done it now, it's like, oh yeah, you just, you exchange another person's time for money. It's a really clear decision on a business level. And you can, you can, definitely make custom hiring choices if you run a bootstrap business. So that's kind of my perspective on hiring for bootstrappers. Awesome. Uh, I think uh, most people are kind of uh, worried when it comes to hiring. Uh, what do you, what's the word? Moonlighters? Uh, designers yeah. uh, are yeah. the only ones who are known to do moonlighting, but I think uh, people are hesitant when it comes to other people to uh, kind of hire them. Uh, okay, so moving on to uh, just uh, wanted to quickly tell everyone who's listening in, if you have any questions, please use the chat section. We'll pick them up. I know we're running uh, already behind schedule. Sorry. But please, oh, no, no, please don't. We're <laughs> loving this. We're loving the whole conversation. Uh, just a little heads up to everyone who's uh, listening. Put your questions in the chat section and we'll pick them up uh, after the discussion we are having. Uh, all right, uh, moving on to the uh, next question. Uh, when you're talking about uh, the risk factors uh, with bootstrap business, 
there's a risk factor with all businesses but specifically for bootstrap is there a point where you can gauge any analytics that will tell you okay this is not going right these are the risks that are coming i can see them are there any yeah. tools or any analytics that you can just see and tell that uh, this is running into a wrong direction what would be oh, a risk interesting well um that there are the the kind of easily traceable things like monthly recurring revenue and churn and retention rates like the things that you usually have in a, a yeah, in a software as a service business right but not every bootstrap business needs to be a software as a service business i'm just gonna take that as an example because you can easily calculate how much money is coming in how many users do i have how many users leave the product uh, month over month and, and how many new people do i need to sustain growth in the business and those are easily measured and those are easily optimized for. I mean, those are those can be optimized for. Nothing is easy in business, but those are at least, um, you can see what moves the needle and what doesn't. So I'm not really going to talk about this because there's just clear rules here. MRR, the bigger, the better. Churn, the lower, the better. Retention, the higher, the better. And, you know, that's just, if you can reduce um, churn, you will increase your retention. So anything you could do to keep people staying is going to be have much bigger impact than actually getting new people into the business. Like keeping a business, uh, like keeping a customer is one of the big rules of a SaaS business. Keeping a customer is much easier than getting a new one. So focus a lot of your efforts on um, value nurturing, like showing people the value of the business that they are receiving, um, making it easy for them to um, adjust the, the amount of money that they pay for the business com uh, comparing to the need, I guess, that they have. Like if, you, if they want to upgrade, downgrade, make that easy for people so they don't completely churn because they can't pay less, you know? Just make, make your business uh, approachable and useful to people and that will keep your retention high, your churn low, and the better, the, the lower the churn, the higher the retention, the more stable your business is. So those are these kind of easily traceable numbers. But what I find very interesting in a bootstrap business. Obviously, if you have no more money, you're out of money and that sucks. Like that is that is another big number that you can measure. It's your bank account. Again, not going to talk about that. You should have money and your business should be profitable from the beginning. It would be best, right? It's nice for it to not make that much money in the start. It's normal. And it's also where my, my business permanent link, the, the best little SaaS that I'm building, I don't think that it's really profitable yet. It's almost there, but it, I, I'm also not forcing it because I'm using it for my own tools. I'll explain that in a second. Um, but it, it's not that it's making that much money, but the goal is for at least the business to pay for itself. And that should be your, your minimum. And anything beyond that is great. What I want to talk about is the founder business fit and the, the founder product fit and the founder market fit. Because those three things are things that you need to consistently evaluate in the bootstrap business or any other business, but in bootstrap business in particular. Because if you hate working in your business, that is not going to be good for the business. If you feel like you spend 15 hours a day chasing after customer service conversations and you would love to relax, but you can't because that's just what your business is, you're not going to have a good time, right? And the business is going to suffer from that because you're not going to spend the energy that's necessary for it to grow, for it to flourish. So you need to every now and then check in with yourself and see, do I still like the business that I have created? Do I still like the business that I'm running right now? And then you look into the product that the business is selling. Do I still stand for that product? Is that still something that I'm proud of? Because Product is not the business, right? A product is a thing you sell. And the business is a, how can you say this? It's an engine that allows you to continuously sell that product. That's what a business really is. So if you hate the business and love the product, well, then you can build a different business around the product. But if you love the business and you hate the product, then you might need a different product so you can still enjoy the thing you're actually selling. And the same goes for the market. And I kind of alluded at that earlier. If you don't like the market anymore, I don't know. Like, um, I personally am not too big a fan of tax advisors because of personal experiences. So if I were to build a product in the tax advisor space and over time I would notice, oh, I thought they were not the nicest people, but they're really not. And I, it's getting worse and worse. Well, do I want to keep doing this? Is this good for me to spend my time and energy on? Probably not. So consistently try every, every half year, I guess, or every three months to see Found a market fit. Do I still like the people? Found a product fit. Do I still like the thing? Do I can still stand for the thing that I'm selling? And found a business fit. Do I like the business that I'm running? And those are hard to measure because these are not metrics, right? You can't put them into a database. These are internal things you have to reflect on. It's like a little goal setting retreat. 
that you need to do every now and then. I mean, we do this in our relationship. My, my girlfriend and I, we every year we do this one day where we just look into where do we want to go? Um, what, what is our financial situation? What are we doing in our professional lives? Where's our relationship going? Is this right? What do we need to, need to do to correct these things? People do this a lot in their personal lives. You need to do this for your business life as well. Treat your business life as a relationship that you have with yourself and see if you can still stand yourself or your co-founders for that matter. Because then it's more like a like a relationship, a traditional relationship. So that would be important to measure. And it's hard to measure. You have to find your own kind of determination or the way of determining how you feel about this. But you need to do it. Because otherwise, you're just hunting numbers. And you're completely omitting anything that's going on in your mind. And that's where most of your life really happens in your mind anyway. And that needs to work. So that's something that you need to take care of as a bootstrap founder too. Awesome. Wow. That that had a whole other level of depth. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, Arvind. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's all my own personal experience. Like a couple of years ago, if you had asked me these questions five years ago, I would pr- probably have just said, yeah, sure, an MRI or whatever. But I've, I've been through the actual experience of noticing how little that matters if your mental health is deteriorating. And I'm glad to be back. I'm glad to be able to share this now with other people so they don't fall into these traps. But it's 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 very important to talk about this. So thank you for appreciating it. That is really nice. No, thank you for actually <laughs> being so real with us. We are, we're very happy that, you know, we're getting this unfiltered insights from you. Uh, before I jump into the audience section, I do have one last question to ask. This goes entirely in a different direction now. Mm. Who should not bootstrap? According to you, who are these people who should not be bootstrapping? Well, yeah, if, if you think you're going to be the next unicorn, the next Uber, the next Airbnb, because your idea is so weird that you need so much money to even <laughs> prove a tiny bit that it might work. Right. And, and we're still not sure on Uber. Right. It's just, that's the weirdest thing about it. Like this company is everywhere and they, they you can get one. I live in Berlin. I could get one within 30 seconds, but I'm not sure if they're ever going to be profitable. Nobody is sure if you, if you read there, the S1 document, if they're ever going to be profitable or if they're ever going to be legal, like you never know. And if you think that the thing that you want to build is something like this, something that is so crazy that if it works, it's going to change the world, go for it. But if you're going to build a productivity tool for a group of teachers that teach in front of their computer, you're not going to change the world, right? You don't need VC money. So what I'm trying to say, that's the inversion, right? If, if you need, if you, if you bootstrap, you're kind of looking at tiny iterations, making the world a little bit better. If you get VC money, you need to change the world in a significant way. You need to disrupt. Bootstrappers, they don't disrupt. They just nap a lot if they can, and then they build little things that help other people in the best way, right? They don't need to disrupt anything. They just need to help. They need to empower people to be a little bit better at what they're doing. And if you look at most bootstrapping products, they are not changing the world. They are just making life a little bit more bearable, and people pay money for that, and then somebody actually gets to spend time with their family. And I I think that's awesome. So anybody who has these crazy out-of-this-world ideas probably not going to be good for bootstrapping because if, if you need to spend a lot of money on marketing, and I already see a question in chat that is about marketing, like you're not going to be able to spend millions of um, dollars or whatever on marketing as a bootstrapper. Never. Like you're never going to be in, in that segment unless you run a like multi-million dollar ARR business. But even then, you likely have different ways of market. Many of, boot, of the bootstrap businesses that I see market through word of mouth. That is either through a community, so the, the kind of embedded entrepreneur approach where you're part of a community and you market the business into the community, or what we did with Feedback Panda, which was also kind of community-based, all the marketing was essentially enabling word of mouth. We had a referral system that was a win-win-win system, like the person referring would get something, the person referred would get something, and we would get another person. So um, setting up a referring referral system that empowers people to help others, even with sharing our business, that was a big thing. And all, all we did in our marketing was shining a light on our customers. 
we were on Facebook in the Facebook groups for our online teachers. We talked to them, we engaged with them right there. We didn't talk much about a product. We were just part of the group, part of the team. We had a newsletter where the first thing in every newsletter was not a product. It was the, we called it the VI Panda because we were calling Feedback Panda, teachers for the pandas, you know, the very important panda. And that was one person from our customers that we picked out every week and we, we sent them an email. We said, hey, we want to feature you as the VI Panda. Can you tell us a bit about your story? How did you start teaching? Um, wh why do you do this? And can you maybe share a picture of you with your family? Our newsletter that went out every week had a different teacher sharing their life story in there every single week. And that was a community building thing. We empowered the community to be with each other, to be a community. And that led to word of mouth sales. We, <laughs> we experimented with paid advertisement once. We spent $100 on Facebook ads that didn't get us anywhere. And, and after that, we didn't spend any more money on paid advertising. It really, we really didn't. We, we, uh, we got some swag that we took to meetups and stuff. That maybe was advertisement that we did. We showed up. We went to those places where people already were gathering and we gave them, we gave them webcam covers. I think that's one of the smartest things that Danielle ever did in the company. We're super proud of her for coming up with this. All of our English teachers were teaching through the webcam. So obviously giving them a webcam cover with a little panda on it, genius, right? Our brand would be in front of them and they would cover their camera because they would only need it for teaching. And if you use a camera a lot, you're quite aware that you might want to protect your privacy, right? It's just such a nice idea. And these little things, they make people talk about your business much more than a marketing campaign with thousands of dollars worth of, I don't know, like Facebook or Twitter or Instagram ads could ever do. If you want to sell to a niche that is a community and most of them are, then do stuff that helps them foster community. Targeting them should be the last thing. Helping them should be the first. It's kind of my perspective on marketing. So, um, and that's also something to bring it back to your question that no VC ever does because they have millions and they just spend it on the regular channels. They put like billboards up for no reason. What's the chance that the people that are in your niche community walk past the billboard? It's very not not high, right? It's a very very low chance. So if you want to target or if you want to talk to the people that you exactly know who they are, well then you just go to where they are and then you talk exactly to them. And I know that many Facebook ads and Twitter ads you can spe specify like with lookalike audiences and all that kind of stuff, right? Clearly who you want to talk to, but your ad being displayed in the stream somewhere is yeah, that's all right. But somebody retweeting something from your account that other people trust, that that particular person retweeting, that is worth like a hundred ads. And I could tell you that because I actually ran a Twitter ad over the last couple of weeks, highlighting my launch tweet, because I, my, my launch tweet for the book, The Embedded Entrepreneur, I got a lot of video views. I didn't get many sales because people don't care for Twitter ads. They see the little sponsored ad thing and no matter what it is, they don't care about it. But if somebody retweets my tweet, I usually get a couple sales. So an organic retweet immediately converts. A paid retweet does not. So I'm doing everything I can for that person to want to retweet my stuff. And that's if you can scale that, if you can get a marketing person into your business that understands this and that spends a lot of time on Twitter. And a good example would be Blake Amel. He is, um, hey, Blake on Twitter. He is the CMO for, um, what is it, Copy AI. That's um, GPT-3 based um, copy business, like a copywriting business. And he has understood Twitter. He knows how to use Twitter and he uses it for them as his personal brand and as a professional CMO for, for copy AI. And it's great. He's a great example of how you can do this. So follow that guy and see what he's doing. He's doing a lot of threats at the moment, but he's just always experimenting and seeing how he can get people to empower each other, to engage with each other. And that is where word the mouth marketing really comes from. Awesome. Uh, I do have a couple more questions, but I think that will have to wait. There are a lot of chat section uh, sure. folks waiting to um, ask the questions. Uh, we can start from the top. Shruti, if you are still here, uh, would ask you to unmute and ask your question. Uh, yes, she's here. Shruti, if you could just unmute yourself and ask the question or else I'll read it out. 
Shoddy oh. internet. I guess you might need to read. Yeah, it. I'll just I'll just read it out. Uh, yeah, she said one small question. As a startup, Google shared credits for all kinds of enterprise needs: emails, cloud services, etc. Is there a competition to that? Uh, is there a competition to this that's lesser the money but just as effective? Ooh, she wants lesser the money but just as effective. As <laughs> yeah. Do we always want cheaper, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, mm. I, I I think it's already quite cheap. Like that, that's the thing. Like with with Google infrastructure and with Amazon infrastructure, they have these very generous free tiers to lock you in, and they are now competing on how much free stuff they could give. So um, I, I I don't think that there is much wiggle room there because there's only a couple of big players, and they already have decided this is how far we will go. So I don't think there's much cheaper stuff. The only thing that I can yeah, really recommend is trying to use these free tiers as efficiently as possible. Not to overcommit. When you're building something, when you're building software, you don't need to build the most complicated like microservice backend infrastructure for a product that, does, that has zero customers at the moment. You just really don't need that. Your prototype can be a very simple thing. And then usually it can run in the free tier of most of these things for a long, long time. So it's, it's the same with Heroku, right? If you, if you run something on Heroku, you only get their weird dyno that goes down if no requests come in. Technical, I, I know, but it's, it's like you can probably run your business on that pretty solidly if you just use the tool that pings your, you know, I, I don't want to go in, into the, the hacks of this, but you can use these free tiers for a long, long time before you actually need to get into the pay tier. So um, just commit to a service because you will need to commit to the service because once the free tier is up, once your credits are out, you will need to pay. And at that point, usually it can get quite expensive if you're not already trying to optimize for price, you know, which is why I'm saying build the minimal, literally the minimum viable infrastructure product that you can for your backend, for your front end, for whatever, and keep that in the, in the free tier and try to still compress it as much as possible so that later, once your credits run out, and they will run out, which is their whole business model, you don't need to pay as much. I hope this answers the question. And I know it sucks because um, as engineers, we always have these big dreams of building really cool things. And those usually quite um, high free tiers allow us to do this, but do the math, see how much this would cost if you didn't have the free tier and the credits and then optimize to get it down. That is, that is my tip. As somebody who has done this and paid a lot of money and then uh, downsized quite a bit. Uh, awesome. Uh, moving on to Ritesh. Ritesh, if you're in the audience, please unmute yourself and ask the question. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, uh, so it was really gold, uh, all those conversations. So as you talked about uh, building audiences, right? Uh, uh, reaching out to the communities and understanding that, uh, their problems, right? That's just probably uh, maybe the beginning idea phase of the whole bootstrapping uh, startup, right? So can you share the major phases or important points or important takeaways from idea uh, to the product market fit uh, for right. bootstrapping and how would it would be different than a traditional VC backed startups? Sure. Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, so this is the whole preparations, preparation stage. That's what I call it in Zero to Solve. Like the whole find your audience, understand their problem, envision a solution and then build a little prototype. This is all kind of prepping for the business to actually hit the ground because then you actually need to launch the business. So you need to build a, a product. You need to have a pricing page. You need to have, a, I don't know, like figured out how to price your product. And all of that happens in the next stage, which I call the survival stage. Like where you try to really figure out um, how can I find a repeatable way of selling the product that I'm building? And that's, like I said earlier, that's what a business is, right? A, a generator, a thing that generates repeatable sales of a product. The product obviously changes over time. The business changes over time, but just as a, as a mental model, that's what a business is. And the survival stage is when you're not yet there until you're there. And then you get to the stability stage where you stabilize and you kind of get the business um, optimize this process, optimize all these little things in between. And then you get to the growth stage where you either grow, like that would get then into potential hyperscaling, not that you ever wanted to do it, but you technically can accomplish that at that point, or you can sell the business or you can do whatever you want with it, right? So we have preparation, um, survival, stability, and growth. And let me quickly talk maybe a bit about the uh, survival stage, because that's also 
quite um, different from the VC world where their, their whole lifetime is usually survival stage. It feels like it because you never really clear, do we have a, a product market fit as this business yet? I don't think Uber, another example, really has figured this out because obviously they're still bleeding money. I would call this a product market fit. I mean, it could be considered one because nobody else is doing it and they seem to be well received by the people using them. But, you know, from a business perspective, from the financials, it's it's not a stable business creating revenue, right? Not as a bootstrap business would be. So that would be the determining difference in a VC funded business where you can always raise another round and defer this kind of um, earnings revenue event into the future. For a bootstrap business, it should come as early as possible as the end of the survival stage, signifying that now you're getting into a stability. And from that stability, you can start hiring people, you can start um, exploring other niches, you can like change your product, um, experiment with your pricing, all that kind of stuff. But the survival stage is the most important phase after getting the initial stage, right? Obviously, you wanna know which audience is serving problem, blah, blah, blah. But once you actually build that business, then you need to, to do a lot of, very in time uh, experimentation to see how you can quickly get to this point where you have this recurring um, engine of selling your product. And that would be through um, yeah, knowing and understanding how your business model works, how your pricing model works, which is if you build a SaaS business, understanding how, how you can actually generate reliable revenue in a SaaS, that would be like obviously recurring revenue every month, but also yearly plans, potential lifetime deals. There's a lot of options that are extremely different for every business. Like we would probably have had a good time with lifetime deals um, if we had priced it right for, for the teachers that we were selling to, because most teachers teach for a couple of years and then they stop. So if we had priced our business at this kind of two and a half years worth of value, and then people only stay for two years, that's a plus, right? But lifetime deals, always tricky. Yearly deals, same thing. People pay yearly, they pay a bit less, but they pay it up front, which is usually good if you need that money to put it into different places, you need to do marketing. I don't know, if you do paid marketing, if you need to do paid marketing because you can't really find the communities in your business, well, then you need to do paid marketing for that you need money. And if people uh, get a yearly subscription for, I don't know, 10 months worth of um, monthly revenue, Usually we, we, we would sell feedback kind of for 10 bucks a month and a hundred bucks for the year, you know, kind of losing two months, but we get, we'd get a hundred bucks in advance. And then you can invest that into further growth and then outgrow the loss that you made on these two months. But every business is different. And those are the, the moments in your business's time, time frame where you need to make those choices, because that really makes a big difference over time. And you want to get to that moment of a stable, reliable, re repeatable um, way of selling the product that you're building. Yeah, and then you get into the stability stage where you can start, um, like I said, you can start hiring, you can start exploring other things. And that kind of feels more like what a traditional business would be doing, right? Um, sales, essentially, like a big um, a sales team or a marketing team, depending on how you do this. If you have like direct sales, you need a sales team. If you have more um, like what we did and what I still do, um, word of mouth and community-based stuff, you need a marketing and a community team. And depending on that, um, that would be the time when you go into these places. But the time before is where you really figure out, can I even make money of this? Like, can I get my first 10 customers that pay for the servers or 100 customers? I don't know how much that would be, depending on the price of your model and the market that you're selling to. That is the, the initial stage. I hope this helps you like figuring this out. I highly recommend reading Zero to Sold. Sorry for the, for the marketing here, but that's where I spell it out. Right? That's the book that really goes from zero, from not knowing what a business is to selling the business and every stage in between. And for bootstrap businesses, which is why I wrote the book, because I want more people to bootstrap. But yeah, it's this kind of preparation, get everything right um, conceptually, then hit the market, survive it, stabilize, and then grow and do whatever you want at that stage. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, the next question is from Anshu. Anshu, if you're there, please turn on your mic and you can ask your question directly. Sure, sure. Thank, thanks, Amit. So my question is uh, like, uh, what are the uh, marketing approach you would suggest other than like uh, audience building? You talked about okay. uh, enable word of mouth, help people. So can you put okay. uh, light on like, with the, like uh, word of uh, enabling word of mouth? Hmm. Well, yeah, word of mouth is the, the best thing you can do. Like quite literally, that's the best marketing you can have. And if you, if you want to get there, 
I mean, just going to talk about this for a second. You, you really need to have something that people want to share. Shareability is a big, big deal. And, and most marketing strategies benefit highly from shareability. There's a, um, an article by Ryan Kulp. I think it's um, on referral systems. Um, I don't know. Somebody might, might Google this at this moment and put it in chat. That would be really nice. Um, yeah, Ryan Kulp, K-U-L-P, um, that talks about how shareable products are. And how you can, um, if you build a shareable product, how this will be immediately helpful for any marketing effort and what the qualities of a, of a product are. Like if it has a network effect built in, if it empowers people, if it gives them status and all that stuff, that's good. But if it gives people an edge and if it shows that people need help and all that stuff, if it, it creates chaos and shows that people are chaotic, well, that is not good, right? And if you, if you can shift your products towards the ones that are good and create more shareability, then all your marketing efforts, be it um, regular um, paid marketing, paid advertising, if people like what they see and it's really nice, then they will share it. And yeah, thank you for putting it in chat, really nice. Um, that is the article that I, that I meant. Um, that if, if you can get this, this uh, to be a part of the product or the business that you have, then people will make marketing much more effective. And for a bootstrapper, effective marketing is the most important part because you don't have that much money to experiment. Right? You can't run A-B tests on Facebook ads for months um, and pushing out like thousands of dollars in marketing just to see which one is 2% better. That's not, gonna, that's not gonna cut it. So you need to have very shareable and very approachable marketing. And anything that is shareable and approachable will likely also be potentially word of mouth marketing. And even if it's not, if you don't have many community members doing word of mouth marketing, you can still have very shareable and approachable stuff um, in paid advertising or in, I, I don't know, guerrilla marketing. It's just like doing little events, but bootstrappers usually are busy people. And if you, if you have to do the marketing at the same time as running your business and writing the code and talking to your customers, you need something that other people can do for you without needing to pay them, which is why word of mouth is such a powerful thing because other people do it because they want to. And anything you could do to get other people to do your marketing for you in commun communities, um, in, in, during events, in, in meetups or something like that, anything you can do by sponsoring meetups, by, by fostering community or by, by having something innately shareable, that will be good marketing. I don't think I can say much more to this. Um, uh, I, I don't have many more ideas. I think I already said most of it during our conversation. So I hope this helps. Read the article. This is really good. And once you've understood these three axes of um, shareability, you can find interesting marketing approaches that resonate with those. And that might, that might help you bootstrapping and marketing at the same time. Thanks, Arvid. Uh, like, we would like to try it out. Let's Wonderful. see how it goes. Thanks. Uh, awesome. So next we have Bhavesh. Uh, Bhavesh, if you could ask your question. Uh, uh, thanks, Arvid, for uh, the insight, the great insights that you have given. Uh, so I often find myself that uh, like a lot of ideas come to my mind and I, I also find a lot of ideas from a lot of other places. But after I find them exciting, like after a point in time, uh, the founder product fit, like it fades away. Then you feel it is boring. So how to keep that motivation of working on a particular idea uh, sustainable in the long run? How to maintain well it? Thanks, thanks for that question. Uh, that's the holy grail, right? Keeping motivation up. But um, here's the thing. Um, th that's kind of why I came up with these initial steps that I talked about earlier with the affinity and the opportunity, the, the awareness, the initial kind of figuring all, all of these, these things out. Because if you start from a point where you genuinely want to help the people that your product is targeting, if that is where you come from, then that will sustain you even though you, your product may not work or there will be competition or you lose motivation because it's day-to-day -day stuff, right? If, if you really like the people that you're serving and you interact with them on a regular basis, that may be the second tip here, that will be a, 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 almost like a perpetuum mobile of, of um, energy because you have this constant source of energy because if you like the people you're helping and Every now and then somebody tells you, hey, your tool is really cool. With that, I could now finally, we, we had this. We had this uh, in Feedback Panda where people used Feedback Panda and they, they quit. They, they actually canceled their subscription. And I asked them, why did you cancel? And they said, 
with Free Tech Panda, I could finally teach so much that I made enough money that I could stop working this job. And now I found a much better job. And now I don't need to, to do teaching on the side anymore. I have a full-time job now, thanks to your tool. And I was like, this is awesome. This is a person that is not paying for a business anymore. That's kind of sad. But I just helped a person stabilize their life. And that led me through the next 10 days of fixing crappy JavaScript bugs in our front end, right? Just having this moment of somebody telling me that I had this impact on their life it just made all the other things go away and it just motivated me and energized me. And if you can find this initial group of people that you want to serve and then, then come up with ideas around how you can help them, then this group will always be there. Your feedback cycles with this group they are always going to be there for you to tap into. And that will sustain you much more than going idea first and then hoping that it helps somebody out there, right? Because most founders who go the idea first approach, they have a nice idea like you have, and they build something like you probably do. And then they try to find the market to fit it into and it may or may not work. And it feels like, oh, why am I doing this? Because you don't start with the people. You start with the idea. But once you start with the people, they're always going to be there right? There's always going to be people who need help. And if you can help them and you help them over time, it's just this giant energy uh, generator for you. And that's what I would recommend, which is why I wrote the book, The Embedded Entrepreneur, because I want more people to go into communities and then come up with ideas and then help people forever. It makes lots of money and become millionaires or something. But that's, that's where this comes from, right? From this source, this well of motivation, this fountain of an unending motivation that comes from helping people, empowering people and make their life better. So, hope you like it. <laughs> All right, then. Uh, we've already taken up 29 extra minutes of your time. <laughs> uh, I know we said one hour, but it looks like the questions are still coming in. If we have time, uh, we can take one or two last questions based on your timing. Is let's do two final? more. I, I, right. I see two more here. Let's do two more. All okay. right. Uh, let's just quickly go over these two. Uh, Pushkar, if you could just ask your question. How should we take? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, how should we go for market research in terms of money? Uh, like even if I uh, make a, a software or an app, then... Uh, uh, as a comp uh, competitor app, uh, how should we go for like its pricing, uh, companies' uh, shares or their uh, revenues and how should we go for, like how to go for pricing and money problems, uh, how should we go for that? Because mm. as an engineering background, we have uh, nothing, I don't know anything about money and business. Right. So, so I have that question. That's, that's a super interesting question. Thanks for asking this. And I, I feel you. I'm an engineer myself and nobody taught me anything about money. Like not even like business money, just money in general. I didn't know how to invest. I didn't know how to save, you know, that's stuff that family usually teaches you. But I'm from, from East Germany and everything is kind of messed up and, and the whole transition and nobody really knew what money was anyway. So yes, money is a big problem. And as engineers, we don't know much about it. But that doesn't mean that we cannot learn a lot about it. And honestly, my, my recommendation is read books, read books on finances, personal finance, which gives you just a concept of how to do this for yourself and read pricing books. There, there are books out there um, that just talk about, um, I don't really have an example in mind, but I, I talk about it in my book too, because many people talk about this in their entrepreneurial journey because they just encounter it at some point. So maybe instead of reading books, go to, go to podcasts, um, the, the ProfitWell people, like uh, Patrick, um, what's his name? Oh God, I forgot his name. Um, yeah, that guy who, who is the, the co-founder of, of Price Intelligently and ProfitWell, these, these two wonderful companies that aren't in the SaaS pricing market. He has a podcast and he appears on podcasts and he talks a lot about pricing. And um, there are quite a couple of founders in this community that have understood pricing and are now sharing their information. Let me just give you a quick rundown of how I approach pricing in a, in a software as a service world. Um, I look at what the comp competition is doing because that is usually the band um, where budget is available in that market. Like if, if there's a competitor and you kind of sell to the same people, their prices indicate that this is how much people are willing to pay. 
because they have done their own pricing research and they understand, okay, if we go higher, fewer people are gonna pay for this. So this is kind of where the, the tolerance level of our audience is. So price at that level. If your product is slightly better than your competition, price a bit higher. If your product is slightly <laughs> basic, more basic than your competition, price a bit lower. Always problematic, what I found as an engineer is we completely and reliably underprice our projects because we think it should be cheap. It's great, but it should be cheap. And as, as, as software people, we also always look for open source stuff. So it's, oh, it's great and free. And that's our baseline of how we understand products. A big problem because most people that are not software engineers, they don't know what open source is. They don't know that you can get like industry grade quality software for free on the internet. They don't know this. So they know that if something is good, it has a good price. It has a high price, it's expensive. So you will probably trick yourself into thinking that you need to price it really low or otherwise nobody's gonna buy it because you come from a world where this actually happens, the software engineering world. But consider this to be knowledge that is actually standing in your way. Try to remove it from your mind and look at the competition in the space and see how much they charge and then charge the same. Because if you build something meaningful and helpful and is actually good and empowering to the community that you're serving or the audience that you are building it for, they will pay for it. And if they don't pay for it, then either you price too high and you can experiment by going down or your product is not fitting the workflow that they have or the medium in which they want to consume it. Consider they're all using mobile phones and you write a SaaS app for the desktop or consider they don't have mobile phones and you write an iOS app, right? That's just a mismatch in terms of medium and, and product. So experiment with those things. Try to figure out why people aren't paying for that thing if they're not paying. And if they are paying, that's good. Then you know you have at least hit a, a lower limit and you can always go up. Pricing is hard. And you will always find pricing to be a moving target. I personally, for, for my permanent link SaaS, I changed my prices a couple of weeks ago, and now I'm just trying to experiment and see if people find them interesting or not. It's an ongoing experiment. But listen to podcasts where, where people talk explicitly about pricing and look at the competition in the space or similar spaces. Just really make a list. This product, this kind of audience, lowest price, highest price, you know, that's it. And do the list for all the products you can find. And then just really look at it and, and see where could you could fit and then try to fit in there. Don't try to underprice them from the beginning. It's super hard to increase prices later. It's very easy to decrease prices because people will always like a, a you know something cheaper. But that would be my compacted advice on pricing. Hey, uh, thanks, Arvid. Uh, it was a great. Thank you. Can I ask something more? Sure. One more is fine. <laughs> uh, what if uh, we are completely building a new product like? We don't have any uh, computer apps or software. We are completely building a new idea, and yeah. and how should we go for? Uh, because in the in that case, we don't have any knowledge about uh, pricing and market or something like any companies uh, in our competition. So how should we? Okay, well, that um, that definitely makes the look at your competition a bit uh, harder. That part. But um, th there's two, two ideas. First off, look at other products in completely different markets that are also without competition and see how they price. You know, like you don't need to necessarily just look in your market. You could also look at other businesses that also are green field or blue ocean businesses and see how they price. Or, and I think that's maybe the best advice that I can give to any question that anybody ever asks me, talk to the people you want to sell to. Like literally ask them, do you have a budget for this and how high would that be? Or if I can give you a two-year contract that is like 80% off right now, how much would you pay? Or 20% off, something like that. Pay me right now. Because that will kind of give you the, uh, some sort of information on how high their budget is. I recommend reading the mom test for these kind of conversations. That is a book that you will need to read to not ask the wrong kind of questions, but trying to get people's direct responses to a price you put in front of them is usually a good idea. If you say, this is gonna be $40 a month and they look at you and they say, never, <laughs> then you have a pretty clear perspective on, on when they're ever gonna pay you 40 bucks a month. But if they say, okay, that's a bit high, totally different information, right? You, they could probably, you could probably have them pay 40 if you provide enough value. 
or they might pay 30 without a problem if you go to 30. So you need to talk to people and pricing. And that's, that's kind of the, the whole idea behind embedded entrepreneurship. Anything you do should be focused on your audience and it should originate within your audience. Any information that you get should come from the people that you want to serve. If you need information on what should I build, they should tell you, I have this problem, please help me. If you need information on how much you should charge, they should tell you, I'm willing to spend 50 bucks a month on this, not more. They, sh they are the source of truth. Anything you consider in your own reflection is just internal. It is not connected to the market out there. It's not connected to reality. It might be connected to a lot of assumptions that you've made that are either wrong or misguided or uh, incomplete. So you need to talk to people. And I know that sucks because as a software engineer, I, I was taught that I should not talk to people because other people should talk to people. Engineers should just do this all the time. Totally wrong. If you are an entrepreneur and if you do all the things, if you are the CEO, the CMO, the CTO, the COO, the CFO, all the C's and all the O's, in one person, you need to be the CEO of talking to people as well. Chief people person, you know, CPO. Mm -hmm. You need to be that yeah. because you, yeah. without that, you won't get any information. Yeah, thanks, Arvid. Sure. And yeah, if you ever need a product manager, I'm here. Please contact <laughs> me. <laughs> yeah, <exactly>. Awesome. <laughs> I love it. It's good to hear. He saw an uh, opportunity and he took a shot. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I think we're already way above time and there are a few questions coming in, but... Uh, yeah, your call, uh, Arvind, if you wish to take uh, Srinivas's uh, uh, question I, or else he could just DM you on I, Twitter. I, th I think I have to run. Exactly. I sent those questions to me on Twitter. My DMs are open yes. and I always, awesome. I will reply. Might take me a bit, but I will reply. You can be sure of that. Awesome. So everyone uh, whose uh, questions are left, we've already mentioned his uh, Twitter credentials. His handles is there. Please go follow him and DM him. Ask, his, ask your questions to him directly. Uh, thank you so much, Arvith. Uh, this was amazing. This was one of the best sessions ever. I'm going to say it out loud. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. And I'm sure you've encouraged a lot of folks here to at least think about bootstrapping now and consider going the bootstrap way. And thank you so much again, once again, for doing this with us. And we'll stay connected with you. And hopefully we'll do more sessions and we'll uh, see more books from you as well. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for all the questions and thanks everyone for just being here. Thank you for spending what is now what almost two hours with me. That is quite the honor. So thank you for your time and for listening to me. Thanks so much. Thank you very much for joining us, Arvid. It was wonderful hosting you and having you as a speaker. And yes, please visit India once this COVID and pandemic is over. You, you're going to find a whole new bunch of audience <laughs> who, who are definitely going to want to listen more to what you're teaching. I, I think you can teach other top tier university, engineering universities here in India, for sure. So thank you, thank you so, so much. much. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, hope everyone has a good weekend. Uh, thanks. Before we go, I just have one last announcement to make. Uh, just watch the space. We have something exciting for tomorrow Ooh. as well. We have a whole weekend <laughs> plan. So, Ooh, wow. yes. yes. <laughs> All right. Have a great weekend. Thank you once again. Bye, everyone. Thank See you. Ya. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.